The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome again through the creaking door. The sound which always signifies the beginning of another tale of danger and suspense. Being in the mystery business, our fables often deal with crime and criminals. This time, it's a thief. But a thief with a very definite difference. For Ruth Moody is a young lady who walks into department stores and simply helps herself. Simply because she can't help herself. Yes, you've heard of her peculiar ailment. It's called kleptomania, the neurotic impulse to steal. But kleptomania isn't the only trouble in store for Ruth. <laughs> mystery drama, The Trouble with Ruth, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Marion Seldes. We're in Barnett's department store in the downtown shopping district, and if it looks and sounds like a battlefield this morning, it's no different from any other Saturday. Well, maybe a little more so, since Barnett is running its semi-annual clearance sale, just as it does every other month. It's the ideal place and time for bargain hunters, and unfortunately, for shoplifters. Uh, pardon me, miss? Yes? Uh, would you mind coming with me just for a moment, please? What for? Uh, our assistant manager, Mr. Hutchins, would like a word with you. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Hutchins. Why she want to talk to me? No, please don't make any trouble. I could call the guard and have you escorted upstairs. You wouldn't want me to do that, now, would you? Guard? Well, why? What have I done? I think you know exactly what you've done now. Will you uh, please come with me quietly? Uh, right in here, please. It's a mistake. I did take the scarf, but I was going to pay for it. Uh, here's the lady, Mr. Hutchins. All right, Bill, thanks. You uh, want me to stick around? No, 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 it's all right. Okay, then I'll get back on the floor. It's murder down there. Uh, more larceny than murder, I'd say. Uh, right. Please uh, sit down. Mr. Hutchins, I, I know it looks like I took the scarf deliberately, but really so I You didn't. were going to pay for it at another counter. Is that the idea? No, I... I wanted to match the color with the purses, and that's why I put the scarf in my bag. I wanted to go over to the handbag section. Would you mind telling me your name? I'm not a shoplifter, so help me, I'm not. My name is Ruth Martin. Is it Mrs. Martin? Look at me. Can't you tell I'm not a thief? I don't even know why I took this scarf. It's just a cheap little thing. It's not at all like the clothes I wear. Well, look at me. Can't you tell? Would you wait just one moment, Mrs. Martin? What's that you've got? Oh, it's just a little handbook we keep, sort of a private record book. You see, uh, most of the retailers in this city cooperate in these matters, supplying each other with the names of known kleptomaniacs. I'm sure you've heard that word before. I am not a thief. Well, that's what I'm trying to determine, Mrs. Martin. Since there is a significant difference between shoplifters and kleptos, the difference, of course, being our ability to prosecute, since... One steals for gain, and one because, well, because she can't help it. No, I'm afraid I don't see any Ruth Martin in the book. All right. It's Moody. Pardon? My real name is Mrs. Ruth Moody. I, I didn't want to give you my real name. I, I didn't want my husband to know Moody. about this. Uh, yes, yes, here it is. Ferraros, three spools of thread, pearl buttons from Wilkins and Smith. Oh, the last time it was a handbag, an awful, ugly, beaded thing. It wasn't even worth more than five or six dollars. Are you going to call my husband? Is that what happens at these other places? Yes. Oh, it was awful. Please, I have the money to pay for the scarf. I'll gladly pay you twice what it was worth. 
Please don't let him know it happened again. Don't you think it's best that he know? Maybe he'll try to help you over the problem. Don't make me beg you. My husband has a job in the city government, a very important Mrs. job. Mrs. Moody, I'm not interested in causing you any trouble, believe me. Look, here, take this scarf back. Well, what's this? No, uh, nothing. Uh, some costume jewelry that no, I Oh, Mrs. About. Moody. You didn't buy this any more than you bought the scarf. It still has the price tag on it. A dollar ninety-five. That's what makes it so unbelievable, Ruth. A dollar ninety-five rhinestone pin. I don't know why I took it, Ralph. Any more than I know what drove me to pick up that awful scarf and just drop it in my bag. Just like those other times. Yes, but you swore to me that those other times would never be repeated. Well, I thought it was over. I really did. I don't understand what goes on in your mind when you do these crazy things. I don't know. It's just an impulse. It seems so terribly easy that things are just sitting out in the open the way they are, and I, I never even stop to think if I like it. Just if I can get away with it. But you never do. You get caught. Maybe... Maybe that's part of the sickness, too, huh? Oh, stop saying I'm sick. I'm not. I'm not. Well, what would you call it? Look, honey, you, you've got to see a doctor. I've told you that a dozen times. I will times. not go to a doctor. I can't stand the idea of it, Ralph. Just talk to one. Give him a chance. Maybe it's something, something simple. Maybe, maybe you're just trying to get punished because of guilt feelings that you can't resolve. Oh, you're wrong about wanting to get caught. I don't. I swear I don't. I've gotten away with a dozen things. What? What was that? Nothing. I don't want to talk about it anymore. And it isn't just three, four times that this has been going on. You're probably out there shoplifting every single day. That's not true. I almost never go into the stores for exactly that reason. All right, Ruth. That settles it. You are going to talk to a doctor. <laughs> Then, uh, you do remember the first time you stole Mrs. Moody? Yes. I remember very well, but... But it was something I really wanted then, Dr. Berger. That was the big difference. Mm. How old were you? I was about eight or nine. I was in school. There was a girl named Fanny Ritter. Her family was very wealthy. She was always the best-dressed girl in the class. Oh, yes, yes. She had this pencil box. It, it was absolutely beautiful, with a blue binding and all sorts of secret compartments. I wanted that pencil box so much. And one day, I, I walked into an empty classroom, and there it was, lying on the seat. Yes, and uh, were you caught? No. I was never caught. Mm -hmm. But that was the biggest thrill of all. Not being caught. But then I... I also realized I couldn't use the pencil box. At least not at school. Yes, yes, I see. All kids steal sometimes. There's nothing abnormal about it. But, uh, you're not a child now, are you? And yet, you still crave this secret feeling, this secret gratification. No! You're wrong. I don't get any pleasure out of taking things. I feel terrible afterwards every single time. Ah, but that may be exactly the gratification you require. I don't want to hear any more. You sound just like my husband. Believe me, Mrs. Moody, neither your husband nor I want to find fault with you. We both want to help you. Well, it's his job my husband is worried about, not me. Why do you say that? Because he works for the city government in the controller's office, and he's afraid if they ever found out about me that he... Why am I talking about Ralph that way? <laughs> I know he loves me. I know he wants to help me. Yes. So why don't you let him try? Let both of us try. No. I don't need a doctor. All I need is to stay out of department stores. <laughs> Mrs. Moody? Yes? 
Uh, hi, Mrs. Moody. Uh, you don't know me, but my name is Tom Andrea. Uh, there's something I have to talk to you about. I know exactly what it is. Encyclopedias. <laughs> or is it magazine subscriptions? Uh, no, ma'am. It's uh, nothing like that. Well, whatever it is, I I'm not interested. It's about department stores. What? You know, stores where people buy things and uh, take things, too, sometimes. Are you from Barnett's? No, Mrs. Moody, I don't work for Barnett's or for Wilkins and Smith or any of those places that you like to uh, shop in. Uh, look, it's uh, pretty drafty out here. Uh, can I come in for a minute? All right. Thank you. Uh, your husband's not home, I suppose. Uh, I mean, it's a working day, so he's at work, right? Oh, that's clever thinking. <laughs> can we uh, talk in here? Only if you get right to the point. Well, now, look, this ain't the kind of thing you like to just blurt out. I mean, I mean, it's kind of sensitive for you. You know what I mean? No, I don't. I mean, it's about you and your husband and so forth. If you think about it for a while, you'll get my meaning. Am I right? You'll have to be more specific. Well, you just won't come out with it yourself, huh? Okay, I'll say it for you. I'm talking about you being a shoplifter. That's a lie. Whoever told you that is a liar. No, 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 no. It's wait, true. Wait a minute. If you think you can blackmail me by telling my husband... No, no, Mrs. Moody. We know that your husband knows all about it. He's been getting you out of jams for years. And what do you want here? Well, believe it or not, I want to give you money. I don't want to take any from you. What for? Services rendered. What? <laughs> I got a little proposition for you, Mrs. Moody. How would you like to make a thousand bucks? A thousand dollars? How? Well, you do like I tell you. You'll get a thousand bucks in the mail. But if you don't, well, your husband may not be able to make a living anymore. You uh, get what I mean? No. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about stealing stuff, Mrs. Moody. About that bad habit of yours. Now, we got a use for that habit. And you better listen to what we have in mind. How do you know about me? Who told you about me? Well, let's just say I got sources. I swear to you, I'm not a thief. Yeah, yeah, sure, I know that. We know it. We? Well, me and my friend. We know you're just a sick lady that you can't help what you do. It's... Well, it's just like you had pneumonia or hay fever. It's, it's not your fault. Am I right? That's right. Yeah, well, it's fine, only your husband still don't want the people around City Hall to know he's got a klepto for a wife, does he? Then this is blackmail. A man in his line of work, he can't afford to have people know his wife steals. Now, some people would understand how it's only a sickness. But others... Well, you know how people are. Tell me how much money you want. I don't want a dime from you, Mrs. Moody. Honest, all I want is your cooperation. You see, my friend and me, we, um, we have a little plan. A really, really sweet little idea. Everybody makes money and nobody takes any chances. I hope you'll be sweeter than that. A plan to do what, for heaven's sake? Well, my friend will give you all the details. All you got to do now is put on your coat and come with me. My friend will give you the whole deal. I'm not coming with you. We're not desperate for your help. Don't get this wrong. But we thought we'd give you a break. Well, oh, it's too bad. If you'd just tell me what you have in mind. Why, shoplifting, Mrs. Moody. A little nice and easy shoplifting. Only this time, not the no $5 piece of junk. This time for something worth more like fifty thousand dollars. Well, troubles have a way of multiplying themselves, don't they? And as you've just heard, the trouble with Bruce has suddenly developed serious complications. Will Mrs. Moody's unwilling petty larceny turn into a larceny of the grand variety? 
We'll find out when we return shortly with Act Two. Mrs. Ruth Moody, faced with the prospect of harming her husband's career, has accepted the invitation of the man who calls himself Tom Andrea. Although her instincts tell her that Tom Andrea isn't his name at all. As they drive towards their unknown destination, she steals sidelong glances at him. Noting the copper sheen of his skin, the look of a man who has spent far too many hours under a sun lamp. But he also has the look of a man who won't take no for an answer. Can't you tell me where we're going? Now relax, Mrs. Moody. It won't be long now. Who is this friend of yours, anyway? You all meet him. He works for a department store, doesn't he? I know they keep records of people like... Well, of kleptomania victims. That's the only way you could have found out about me. I just lean back and enjoy the ride, huh? Aren't you afraid I might recognize him if he's one of the people that I've met? Here we are, Mrs. Moody. I told you it wasn't very far. The Hotel Hamilton. Looks like a fire trap. Well, it's not very fancy, but it's private. We can all have a nice, quiet talk. Just the three of us. <laughs> You, Tom? Yeah, that's me. The lady with you? Yep, she's here. Just a second, then. Oh, I... Now, now, don't, don't be scared, Mrs. Moody. My friend doesn't really look like that. He's just got a stocking over his face. Come in. I, uh, hope you will forgive the mask, Mrs. Moody. I know it looks grotesque, but it's necessary. For your own protection. For me? It's important that you don't recognize me after our business is concluded. It would be embarrassing if we were to run into each other in uh, different circumstances. In a department store, for instance? What my friend means, Mrs. Moody, is that if you started hollering for the cops when you saw him again, we uh, would have to do something about you. Understand? Yes, I... I understand. But please don't be alarmed. Nothing like that's going to happen. I can assure you that I am not a professional criminal. No more than you are. Then what kind of criminal are you? Why don't you sit down? The sofa's the only comfortable seat in the room. Here, let me take these papers away. I was just drawing up a few diagrams to help you understand exactly what you have to do. Diagrams? Would you like some coffee? We have a small kitchen. There's a pot already made. No, 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 I don't want any coffee. Tom, why don't you do the honors? Do you drink yours black, Mrs. Moody? I'm afraid I don't have any cream. All right, uh, black coffee. I see, Mrs. Moody. I told you it was going to be very friendly. Well, now, uh, how much has Tom told you about our little enterprise? He just said that if I didn't help you, you'd tell my husband's employers about me. Well, I really hate for that to be the inducement, Mrs. Moody. I was hoping that uh, you'd cooperate more willingly. Why should I? Well, didn't Tom mention the thousand dollars? He also mentioned something about fifty thousand dollars, about shoplifting something worth a fortune. <laughs> Don't tell me you have qualms about it. A lady with your history? <laughs> you just don't understand about me. I don't take things because they're valuable or even because I want them. I'm not a thief. Uh, not in the ordinary sense of the word. Yes, yes, we, we know that. And that's exactly why we're taking you into our little circle, Mrs. Moody, because you're a kleptomaniac, not an ordinary thief. And that's why you can help us commit an extraordinary crime. But I don't want to commit a crime, and I don't want your thousand dollars. Here's your coffee, Mrs. Moody. Let me tell you what makes it so different, Mrs. Moody. 
An ordinary crime entails a certain amount of risk, but this particular crime is guaranteed to be risk-free. Oh, that's what people always think. No, Mrs. Moody, even professional criminals recognize a certain degree of chance when they plan their enterprises. Personally, I would never get involved in anything like that. I loathe the idea of being arrested. Well, so do I. And I know exactly what it feels like. Ah, but you've never been arrested, have you? You've been detained, questioned, reprimanded, warned, but you've never been arrested once. Isn't that true? Well, why should I be? I told you, I'm not a criminal. No, you're not legally liable for your little thefts, Mrs. Moody. You steal because you have to steal. And if you're caught, you merely give back what you've stolen, and that's that. No arrest, no prosecution, no risk. You beginning to see the point, Mrs. Moody? You want me to steal something for you. That's right, Mrs. Moody, and something a great deal more valuable than, shall we say, a spool of thread. Oh, dear Lord. Let me explain our plan in detail. At 12.15 tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow? At 12.15. You will enter a shop called Travel's on 47th Street, just off 5th Avenue. You may not know the place. It's a rather expensive jeweler's. You will approach a certain counter. The diagram will make it clear which one I... Wait a minute. You're talking as if I've already agreed to do this thing. Please look at the diagram, Mrs. Moody. You will approach this counter and engage the attention of the salesman. You will ask to see a certain tray the one I've marked with the arrow. A moment or two after you begin to examine that tray, there will be a disturbance in the store. Uh, right, a disturbance. The disturbance will take place on the other side of the counter. It is almost inevitable that your salesman will have his attention drawn away from you when it occurs. In all likelihood, he'll leave you and go to see what has happened. That's when you will act. You will pick up the diamond pin on the upper right-hand corner of the tray and drop it into your purse. And then you'll simply walk out the door. You're really mad. As you can see from the drawing, the distance between the counter and the door is a very short one. You can reach it within three or four seconds. You can be sure that your salesman will be much too occupied to notice that you have left. I won't do any such thing. That's plain and simple robbery. When you reach the outside, you'll see a man with a yellow canister collecting funds for children's welfare. The man will approach you immediately. You will drop the diamond pin into the opening of the canister and walk to the corner. There will be a taxi there in all probability. It's a hack stand. If there isn't a taxi waiting, hail one or walk to the bus stop. Believe me, you will have ample time to make your getaway. There isn't going to be any getaway. I am not going to do anything so insane. As I said before, you'll be perfectly safe. You'll have absolutely nothing to lose. If you're stopped before you reach the exit, simply give yourself up. When Travels learns of your little uh, idiosyncrasy, no harm will come to you. It'll be just another neurotic incident, nothing more. You're wasting your breath. You'll tell them about your problem. They'll check with other stores and find your case history on file. No, there's no way I'll do such a thing. Hey, what's the matter with you, lady? Didn't you hear the man? You can't get into trouble doing this. But your husband will if you don't. Let me out of here, please. Pick someone else out of those files. <sighs> All right, Tom. If that's how Mrs. Moody wants it. Then I can go... The door was always open, lady. See? But if you change your mind, Mrs. Moody, just call me here at the Hotel Hamilton. Just ask for room 408. But if I don't hear from you tonight, well, you know what we'll have to do. <laughs> You've sure been quiet tonight, Ruth. Have I? You, uh... You didn't go out today, did you? No. I told you I wasn't going anywhere. I was just wondering. I mean, you said something about dinner tonight, about cooking something special, and... 
<laughs> Here we are with last night's meatloaf. But you said you didn't mind. Oh, of course I don't mind. You know I'm not fussy about food. I know. You're just too nice for your own good sometimes, Ralph. And, uh, you just weren't feeling up to cooking today, is that it? Oh, I know what you're thinking. You think I went on another shopping spree, or should I say shoplifting? No, Ruth, I didn't think anything of the kind. Well, I didn't. I swear I didn't. Okay, okay. Ralph, can I ask you something? Sure. What, what would happen if, if people knew about me? What people? The people you work for in the controller's office. Or, um... The mayor himself. What if they knew about my uh, illness? They'd know, that's all. Would it hurt you? Honey, this is silly. Nobody knows about your problem. But you and me and a few department stores. And Dr. Berger, of course. The doctor you won't see anymore. But if they were to find out, would it hurt you? Look, haven't we got enough to worry about without thinking the worst? Then it would be bad for you. Someone in your position where... Honesty is so important. Ruth, you're not dishonest. You're sick. There's a tremendous difference. That's why I'm so sorry you won't see that doctor. But, but would everyone understand the difference? I mean, when they learned about my stealing things, would they think twice about you? You want the truth? Yes. Yes, they would. They're only human. No, no, they're worse than human. They're politicians. They have to be elected to office, and that's exactly the kind of scandal they don't like. Yes. I guess I've always known that was true. Um, honey, I think I could use some more gravy. Yes. Oh, I have some in the kitchen. I'll be right back. Is this the Hotel Hamilton? Room 408, please. And so Mrs. Ruth Moody has taken the first fatal step. And tomorrow at noon, she'll take several more steps to the doors of Travel's jewelry. And for the first time in her life, Ruth will steal and know the reason why she's stealing. Will it really make a difference? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. At 11.30 the next morning, Mrs. Ruth Moody left her apartment and took a 5th Avenue bus to 47th Street. None of the other passengers saw anything unusual in her expression. They couldn't read the turmoil of her thoughts or the fear that haunted her eyes behind the sunglasses she wore to hide them. She kept telling herself that what the man in the stocking mask said was only too true, that no matter what happened, she couldn't be blamed for what she was about to do. She was still telling herself that when she pushed open the heavy glass door of Travel's. May I help you, Mary? Oh, uh, yes, please. I'm looking for a diamond pin. It's a present for my mother. I see. Uh, do you have any particular kind of pin in mind? We have everything from abstract designs to representational pins. You know, animals and flowers and so forth. Mm. Maybe if I just uh, browsed a little? Certainly. You can see some of our selection right here, but uh, we do have others. Oh, yes. There's so many, aren't there? Of course, it would help if you knew the price range. Mm. Uh, oh, well, the price isn't important. It's just that the pen be right. Yes, I see. Um, this tray right here, on the first shelf. Yes. Well, that seems to have quite a few nice pens. Yes, I'll bring it out for you. Actually, these are some of the best stones in our collection. You have good taste. They really do sparkle, don't they? This is uh, what I meet by representational. 
As you can see, it's in the shape of a cat. Oh, well, no, no. My, my mother hates cats. I think maybe just something simple. Something. Uh, you uh, just take your time. All right. Thank you. What was that? Someone smashed one of my cases. Again. Excuse me. I'm terribly sorry. I'm, I'm clumsy things are it's, it's all my fault. I was holding my umbrella under my arm. It just slipped out and hit the glass. Now, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I've got to do it now. I, I, I really don't know. Yeah. It's all right. All right. I've got it. Get back, please. Uh, Bob, would you lend a hand over here? There's glass all over the merchandise. I feel dreadful about this. I, it's I quite all right, sir. No harm done at all, I assure you. Uh, done it. I've really done it. Outside. Help the needy children. Help the needy children, lady. What? Please help the Children's Welfare Society, lady. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Here. That's all I have. Thanks very, very much, lady. Thanks a lot. Help the needy children. Is that you? Yes, I'm home. Oh. How are you, honey? Uh, I'm all right. You sure? You don't look so good. No, no, I'm I'm fine, really. Would you like a drink? Yeah, I wouldn't mind, thanks. Um, what'd you do today? I went out for a little while. Where to? Oh, no, in particular, I took a walk. Well, it was nice. Uh-huh. Took some things to the cleaners, did a little marketing. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. For heaven's sake, stop looking at me like that. I can't bear the way you look at me sometimes, Ralph. I'm sorry, Ruth. It's nothing deliberate. Well, of course it's deliberate. It happens all the time now. You keep staring at me as if you're trying to read my mind. As if you wanted me to confess something. Now, Ruth, that isn't true. You've got to stop thinking such things every time I look at you. What's going to happen to us, Ralph? What kind of marriage are we going to have from now on? Ruth, we've been married six years now. I think we know how to live with each other. But you can't live with this disease of mine. You can never stop suspecting me of having stolen something again. Isn't that what you're thinking right now? All I'm thinking about is that you don't look well. And how disappointed I am that you won't see Dr. Berger. I... I called him today, by the way. What for? Well, I just wanted to talk to him, find out if... if there was anything more I could do to help you. And what did he say? He said there might be. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I told Berger about our talk last night, about... How worried you are that the people at City Hall might find out about, about your illness. Now, he told me that was an important part of your guilt syndrome, whatever that means. Oh, I hate that psychiatric double talk. Just the same, he, he thought you'd be a lot better off if you weren't concerned about such things. If you were able to admit that you were ill. I do admit it. That doesn't mean that other people have to know about it. Ruth. I told them. What? I told McGuire, the controller. I took him out to lunch. I told him all about your kleptomania. Oh, no, Ralph. Oh, no. Oh, look, I, I began to realize that I was hiding it, too, that I wasn't treating it like an illness, either. That I was acting as if it were something shameful. What did you do it for? For us, Ruth. But now you'll lose your job. No, I'm not going to lose my job. It's going to be all right. But you said... No, I know that. all the dumb things I said last night about how this sort of thing can hurt a politician. Well, I was wrong. McGuire is more of a human being than a politician. You mean he's not going to tell anyone else? He won't give me away? No, that's not what I meant. McGuire suggested that we both go and talk to the mayor himself about this. Oh, Ralph, you can't. I already have, Ruth. What? I've seen the mayor. Do you know what he said? 
He said that it wouldn't make any difference to him this year or next year when he recommends me for the number one job in the controller's office. The number one? That's right. McGuire is moving up. I'm next in line for his job. And the mayor is behind me now, Ruth. Do you think he'd be behind me if he really thought my wife was a thief? Oh, dear Lord! Ruth! Oh. Honey, honey, what is it? Oh, why did I go through this? What's the matter, Ruth? I just told you everything's no, okay. No, no. I've ruined everything now, Ralph. <laughs> if you knew what a horrible thing I did today, you'd... you'd... What are you talking about? I am a thief now. God help me, Ralph. I really am a thief. <laughs> And stay calm, Ruth. Did you get a look at the man who broke the glass with his umbrella? Do you think that he was the same man you met yesterday at the Hotel Hamilton? I'm sure he was. But I told you he was wearing a stocking mask over his face. And this this other man, though, the one who called himself Tom Andrea, he was the same man who was collecting for children's welfare outside the store. Yes. Ruth... You know, there's only one thing to do now, don't you? What do you mean? We've got to tell the police. Oh, Ralph, no, that would be awful. Travels will have discovered the theft by now. They, they must have your description from the clerk. Sooner or later, you might be identified. But they can't do anything to me, Ralph. I'm not responsible. I am sick. No, Ruth, in this case, you are responsible. That's why we have to call the police. Mrs. Moody, here's the typed statement you gave us. Can I go home after I sign it? Yes, yes, of course. But uh, better read it over first. What happens after that, Lieutenant Amos? That depends. On what? Well, mostly on whether or not your wife has told us everything. But I swear I have. I'm not saying your story is phony, Mrs. Moody. My own viewpoint is that it's too cockeyed to be phony. But uh, that may be a subtle way of looking at it. Why should she lie about this, Lieutenant? What would my wife have to gain? Well, she could stand to gain a diamond pin worth almost 50,000 bucks. But she doesn't have the diamond. She gave it to them. Yes, that's a story. But uh, let's say, for example, that those two men never existed. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say. I'm telling you how other people might see this thing. If you were a crook, and you realize that you'd been spotted in Travels? Well, this story of yours would put you in the clear, wouldn't it? But it's true. Every word of it. But you see the problem, don't you? You've been identified as the robber. You've confessed to stealing the pin. The fact that you're a known kleptomaniac doesn't help. Some people might even be nasty enough to say that you got yourself that reputation deliberately. This is incredible. You're accusing my wife of being a thief. Oh, what can I say to convince you? If you could only give me a better description of those two men. Well, I've done the best I could. The first man, he was of average height, dark hair, very sunburned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You keep telling me about that sunburn. But that's not going to last very long, is it? Lieutenant... You think that sunburn was a kind of disguise? I'm sure it was, Mr. Moody. Oh, and the other man, he wore a stocking mask. There's no way I can describe him. And what about the hotel, Lieutenant? No good. It's a kind of a dump which doesn't even bother to keep a register, even though it's a city ordinance. But the clerk might be able to identify the man who took the room. Maybe, if we could produce him. Only, uh, how do we do that? Uh, what about the thousand dollars they promised to send her? Oh, I wouldn't count on that. If she's telling the truth, you'll never hear from him again. Okay, so maybe it's a new gimmick. Maybe one of them works in a department store, has access to the names of recognized kleptos. I'm sure he did work in a department store. Yeah, and so do thousands of people, Miss Moody. All you've got to do is name the one. And if she can't, what happens then? I think you know the answer to that. 
Will I be arrested? But you can't arrest her. She's sick. She was seeing a doctor. And I'm going to see him again. Oh, oh, so help me, Ralph. You really mean that, Ruth? I'm... I'm not going to stop seeing Dr. Berger until I'm cured. Unless they send me to prison first. Well, have you read the statement, Miss Moody? Yes. Yes, it's all right. I'm ready to sign it. Fine. Now, let's see. I thought I had a pen on this desk. Oh, well. I think there's one in my purse. I'll get it. Hey, it's funny. What is? Well, this isn't your pen, Ruth. I don't recognize it. Do you? Let me see. No. No, that isn't my pen. Oh, Ruthie, no. Not again. You mean you stole it, Mrs. Mooney? I'm afraid I did. I, I remember now. When the man was drawing the diagrams of the jewelry store, he left his pen on the coffee table and I... I just couldn't stop myself. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You stole his pen, the man in the stocking mask? Yes. Will you arrest me for that, too? Let me see it. Miss Moody, do you realize there's a name on this pen? It's from Barnett's department store, and it's engraved with the name of the owner. What? Barnett's department store, J.M. Hutchins. Hutchins? He's the assistant manager. He is the one. Lieutenant, you found your man. <laughs> well, what do you know? This is the first time I've ever seen the proof of that old chestnut. Old chestnut? That it takes a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> The moral of this story might be, never steal anything small, particularly if it's a diamond pin worth $50,000. Well, you'll be happy to know that the police investigation proved the guilt of Mr. J.M. Hutchins and the innocence of Mrs. Ruth Moody. And the last we heard, the only trouble with Ruth was going to be a little one. I'll be back shortly. you've enjoyed our story and we hope your reception has been as good as the reception we've been getting at the Radio Mystery Theater. In case you haven't heard, we're attracting millions of listeners all over the country. Yes, television has its rabbit ears, but we have human ears. Thank you for lending them to us. Our cast included Marion Seldes, George Petrie, Jack Grimes, Jackson Beck, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Listen to Mystery Theater again tomorrow night, same time, same station.